size at which the average you know, codfish around here can eat, there's virtually nothing else that will feed on it. And these days, there's more lobsters than probably ever before. So a community long dependent on fishing is now dependent primarily on lobster. But lobsters, too, could be easily overfished. A key factor in careful management is to understand their breeding cycle. Stalewagen's rich waters provide an important location for research. I work primarily in the coastal waters of Maine, and there the lobsters are mostly juveniles. And I'm hoping that out here on the bank, I can find some breeding areas where there are larger lobsters, the reproductively active lobsters. Why are you doing this? I mean, what are we learning? Well, what we know about how lobsters get together and make more lobsters is based on observations made in large aquaria. And what we know is based on laboratory observations. In the field, no one's ever recorded this lobster behavior. Wow, look at this. I'd say that's probably 25, 30-year-old lobster. Wow. So, all we have to do is find some females that are ready to mate, attach a tag, so we can go back and follow them to the big male. It transmits a signal that we can listen to underwater using a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone. Each individual lobster has a separate frequency and code. And underwater, you listen to track the lobster who's wearing this. It's important to know what habitats lobsters use for courtship and mating behavior, because without reproducing, there is no future for the lobster. In the last 10 years, the deployment of lobster gear within the sanctuary has increased you know, greatly. And one of the, the concerns is that as fishing pressure increases within an area, the, the size and age of the structure of the population is going to change. Having big, old animals is extremely important to maintaining a functioning biological community. Alrighty. We do have uh, some very large females. This has been a proven producer of eggs, the future of our generations, right? This is what we want to do. We have to release this. We do have a much larger... Whoa. With, uh, take Are a, they egging out they're yet? They're egged. Now, those are close to hatching. Yes, they are. Yeah, you can see the little eyes uh -huh. in each egg. There are two eyes. And as the female gets larger, this gets wider, and she carries more eggs. Not only does a larger female carry more eggs, she carries larger eggs, and her offspring are larger when they hatch. So these animals are particularly important to the fishery, the future of the fishery. With, with people like Diane sharing her expertise with other scientists, with the fishermen, has uh, worked to everybody's advantage. The lobster is an icon of New England seafood, but it's also wildlife. And the National Marine Sanctuary uh, is beginning to look at, well, how do these organisms function in this larger biological context? And are there things that we can do that help, can help restore the balance you know, in, this, in this place, in this national treasure? Even a fish as unlikely as the American goosefish, whose enormous mouth will hold half of its own body weight, plays a role as predator or prey in the carnival of creatures that crisscross the sea alive with diversity. Stalewagen Bank offers a cautionary tale, not only of what taking too much can do, but of the irreplaceable value of even the most unlikely species. In the cold waters of Monterey, California, similar lessons. The Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is the deepest of all the sanctuaries, with a grand canyon of rich, upwelling waters that nourish an explosion of life. got 
33 species of mammals. We've got unusual birds. We've got 340 species of fish. This is a very unique and, and unusual area. But this incredible ecosystem lives day to day in a delicate balance with industry, agriculture, fisheries, and recreation, a balance that we have only recently begun to understand. Unfortunately, the learning curve came with a high price. Our actions over the last 150 years have pushed the vibrant diversity of Monterey Bay to the edge. In the first half of the 20th century, Monterey Bay was one of the most productive fisheries in the world, blessed with an abundance of fish year after year. Communities sprang up overnight, fortunes were made, businesses were booming. When I was a boy growing up in Monterey, this was the sardine capital of the world. After a 50-year bonanza riding a silver tide of seemingly inexhaustible sardines, finally the last ones were canned, and Monterey crashed. A lot of people in Monterey were the victims of uh, what happened, uh, because there were a lot of jobs on Cannery Row, there were a lot of jobs associated with the fishing industry, there were a lot of families that were very dependent on that economically, and suddenly it was wiped out, it was gone. With fishing dramatically reduced, life underwater began to return to the bay without the sardines. Around the same time, one site was made off limits to fishing, and the team stops at one of Monterey Bay's totally protected areas. Poi Lobos is a 500-acre reserve, and it is precipitous, and it is prolific with life, and because it has been a reserve for over 40 years, it is as it should be, and as it was many years ago. If a healthy marine ecosystem could be compared to an art museum, Point Lobos would be among the world's greatest, a Louvre, a Uffizi, a national gallery. The color and texture of the exhibits would change constantly, depending only on the good luck of the observer. And the price of admission, protected areas. Precipitous it and was prolific. precipitous, precipitous. And prolific. <laughs> <laughs> to see the contrast that can exist between complete protection and unlimited use, even within a sanctuary, the team dives next at Maccabee Reef. Gone are the colorful sea stars, the huge schools of fish, and the wide variety of sea life. Instead, the team found remnants of old cannery row equipment and an eerie emptiness. Although the complex diversity is diminished here, the area is far from lifeless. commercial fishing and the recreational fishing. Understand that we are on their side, that by protecting these waters, it will act like nurseries and repopulate. I think what fishermen need to understand, and I say this as someone whose grandfather was a fisherman, that if we don't renew that resource, if we don't take care of that resource, then there will not be future generations of fishermen. If we exercise good stewardship, then it'll be there for future generations. I mean, they will benefit more than anyone. Wise management with any animal will in turn benefit other species as well. 
This California sea lion population is doing very well. They're increasing at the rate of four, even five to six percent a year. And my curiosity with these guys is what are they doing right as compared to the other sea lion species that are either very small populations or populations that are in decline. And ultimately, my interest is to work with fisheries biologists and try to put that information together with the fisheries management folks when they're modeling how much fish we can take from the, from the oceans. So what we've got is it's a floating platform with a 12 by 10 enclosure. And the idea is that the animals would just passively jump inside. We take one animal at a time, put them, bring them into that squeeze cage, and the squeeze cage works such that the side walls are interlocking. So that we can bring the walls, the side walls down like that and push the animal toward the bottom of that squeeze cage and essentially physically restrain them. Putting one of the a CTD tag, which as the animal dives, it collects information on the dive depth, dive duration, temperature of the water, and then actually uh, gets a conductivity, which we can then use to calculate salinity. They've got a beautiful new coat of fur now, so we actually just use five-minute epoxy and glue it to their fur, and it just, as long as you glue it on there well, we're hoping those tags will stay attached for anywhere from minimum three months as hopefully as much as six or seven months. The tagging of Pacific Pelagics, or TOPS project, monitors how wide ocean processes affect many species, including sea lions. But tagging is only the beginning. The real results are at the computer. Just go to uh, the internet and go to topcensus.org. We get to this front page here, and you can see all the different species within TOP that are being tagged. So what we can do is look at this information on a day-to-day -day basis. And after a season of, of data, we can sit back and start to look at the larger picture as far as how animals use the ocean on a year-to-year -year basis. If we want to look at all the different species combined of sharks, um, tuna, uh, albatross, seals, and sea lions, you can see that it's almost entirely covering the, the, the North Pacific. And what we find doing a little bit of analysis is actually where they're spending most of their times are these hot areas, these red areas. And that's right where we are. Yeah, we're right here in the Monterey Bay, and this is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Among the now abundant sea lions, those tagged by the TOPS project become animal explorers, sending back data on the ocean itself like a remote vehicle, but one full of life and full of play. But sea lions aren't the only comeback story. There's the colossus of all pinnipeds, the elephant seal. Offshore from San Francisco, the Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary is one place where elephant seals, once considered extinct, began their unexpected recovery. Southeast Farallon Island is a national wildlife refuge managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and where elephant seals formed a breeding colony in 1972 and grew rapidly. If I told you everything going on on the beach behind me, it would be like a soap opera. There's cows losing their pups. There's other cows adopting their pups. There's males fighting for dominance. It's, there's massive social interactions going on back here every single day. So you don't need TV at all. Your, your soap opera is right That's here. That's right. I have a telenovela <laughs> right at my door. <laughs> the males really have a very tough life. Yep. Or maybe they have it good for a couple Brutal of years. Brutal and, and short and a, good, a couple of good years for, yeah. for the few, the few percent that are in this position of having a harem. Most of them won't ever have that. The only way for a male to gain a harem is to dethrone the alpha male also called the beach master. Capable of diving as deep as a mile, a mature male can be 16 feet long and up to 5,000 pounds. It's always a matter of just size. If the new guy is smaller, he'll back off. That fight was just a couple hits. The new guy, he backed off. It's really rare when you have a really close matchup and then you have a big big bloody battle between two closely matched males he was going to try his luck it's the only way to find out is to come up and challenge one of these guys who has a harem of his own life is not much easier for the females who arrive at a predictable time each year with the majority giving birth to pups on crowded beaches around the same time pups that weigh 60 to 80 pounds When a 
pup is born, there's excitement and a lot of agitation. Other females can smell the newborn, and if a nearby female has her own pup, she'll be aggressively protective, even biting and attacking the new baby. She has to stay with her pup at all times to protect it from injury and to avoid getting separated. The pups will nurse for only a month, quadrupling their weight. Then she mates with her massive beachmaster and returns alone to feed in the sea. The pups will remain for a couple of months, surviving on their fat and teaching themselves to swim and to feed. There is now hope that the elephant seals will continue to reign on the beaches they have reclaimed, all within the boundaries of the National Marine Sanctuaries. We're so fortunate to have these rocky outcroppings in the middle of the, the ocean off the coast here that is virtually undisturbed by humans. We have the largest concentration of breeding seabirds in the contiguous United States. So we have 300,000 seabirds that breed on the Farallon Islands next to a population of 8 million people in the San Francisco Bay Area. The ocean provides the food, and then the islands provide the safe haven, the home that they can go home to and rest, that they can um, breed and give birth to their young. There's four um, eastern boundary currents in the world, and they're upwelling zones. And the Gulf of the Farallons happens to be in one of these upwelling zones. And they're the richest marine environments in the world. And what makes them so special is that the Gulf of Farallons has a wide continental shelf that drops into a deep abyss. And in that abyss is where all the nutrients concentrate. So when the wind in the spring blows the water offshore, the nutrients, the cold water, come to the shallow area. The sun beats down, and it blooms. You just think of like a field, and there's tons of food, and the food attracts fish, seabirds, seals, sea lions, whales, dolphins, and sharks. Each fall and winter, white sharks congregate on the Farallons to prey on young elephant seals as they leave the beach. With a growing number of seals, the white shark population at the Farallons is one of the largest in the world. The team is less likely to see a white shark during spring but they take precautions. We're in 60 feet of water. As you guys know, we're in uh, shark country, so I would think you'd want to get in and get on that anchor line and get to the bottom. The water at the Farallons is green because it's nutrient-rich, sunlit, and full of phytoplankton, or marine plants. The team dives through clouds of tiny mice and shrimp, like swarming bugs. They bear witness to fantastic invertebrates, animals without backbone, growing large and colorful, bathed in these rich waters. A bouquet of anemones are among the network of life that competes for space and resources. Unfortunately, it's what the divers don't see that's a concern. Historically, the ocean has been considered a sewer. That's the way people felt. And so if you had something you didn't want, you threw it in the ocean. We have the second biggest nuclear waste dump site in the world, right off San Francisco. There was estimates of about 47,500 barrels of radioactive material that was dumped out there somewhere between 1946 and 1970. And those barrels are 55-gallon drums. They're 16-gauge steel, and they only have a life expectancy of about 10 years. Over the years, I had, when I was sanctuary manager of Gulf of the Farallons in the northern part of Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, we had storage from fishermen. I picked up a, this glowing fish, and I picked up an 80-foot-pound sponge, and, and I'd hunt down these things because I thought they were very important. And we'd never been able to determine any of those type of stories or anecdotal evidence and we really looked. We've gone out with the military, we've taken submarines out um, to identify where barrels may be located. The majority of the barrels that we found 
we're probably in the 450 to 550 fathom range. Have you seen a lot of them uh, breached? Almost all, almost all had, had no containment of materials for inside. The containers were never meant to contain. They were meant to move the material to the bottom. Well, the concern about any radioactive material is potentially that it could be cancer-producing and it could bioaccumulate in the food chain and then be found in species of fishes, say, that people would eat out of the seafood markets. And really, if we're to understand what's happening out there, that's something that we ought to be concerned about now and something we ought to be monitoring on an ongoing basis. And Tom, why would we dump radioactive material out in the ocean? Well, that's a good question. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, when we first started bringing these materials out and dumping them in the ocean, we believed basically out of sight, out of mind, or the solution to pollution is dilution. So since 1970, we haven't dumped anything in the no, waters? No, nothing. No, no nuclear materials. No nuclear materials. Right. Well, that's a start. <laughs> it is a start, and I, I would hope that uh, they don't again look at the ocean for any reason, but especially for things that one, you don't know what they're going, damage they're going to cause. Two, you don't have no way of removing it if, if it is causing damage. And, and, and three, could have significant environmental effects. We don't put that in the ocean. The, the ocean is the life of the, the world. Now I was going to say America, but it's the life of the world. And it's a fluid environment. And, and there's too much of a danger to put materials in there that are a hazard to the marine environment or to people. Without major funding for more research or clear evidence of harmful effects, the issue of this nuclear dump site remains, for better or worse, hidden. But back in Monterey, the invisible effects of agricultural and domestic runoff are being investigated. What we have done is tried to stop the concept that we dump things in the ocean by first working with farmers. We have really gotten away from the traditional neurotoxic chemistries, and we're really using products nowadays that are very selective. They're very narrow and specific towards the insect or the, the uh, pathogen that we're going after. We have uh, completely adopted drip irrigation on our 15 ranches, so we're able to put place the water right where the plant needs it and not waste water and not create uh, unnecessary um, overuse or runoff. All right, because this is very nice, rich soil. You wouldn't want it to end up down there in the, in the slough. Everything we do in our daily lives impacts the water quality, from driving our cars to um, picking up after our pets to, you know, not washing our cars on the streets. All of those things can help improve water quality. Whenever possible, after a major storm, volunteers take samples to measure water quality. So it looks like the transparency here is just about four centimeters, and um, that's, that's quite low for a transparency reading. Typically, anything below 25 centimeters is a red flag for us. We have a lot of volunteers who will go out middle of the night, pitch black, pouring rain, and are really committed and dedicated. And, you know, if we didn't have these volunteers out helping and monitoring all these different locations, they just would not be monitored. You know, the, the agencies just don't have the staff or the time to be able to come out and, and take these measurements and collect these samples. In a surprising turn, samples of urban runoff may hold important clues as to what is affecting an icon of Monterey Bay, the sea otter. Almost hunted to extinction for their pelts 150 years ago, before they were protected and declared threatened. Sea otters have had an unusually slow recovery in Monterey Bay. Urban runoff may be involved. As a brew of chemicals washes from city to sea, it carries a parasite transmitted by household cats, which can cause fatal brain damage in otters. One unlikely contributor may be disposable kitty litter. Lovable, at risk, and a keystone species, Sea otters are receiving research attention, as are the deep waters of Monterey Bay, waters at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute studies. So the Western Flyer is our expedition ship, and it's designed to go out to sea for up to three weeks at a time. Uh -huh. We could put 25 people on board, and on board we have a 4,000-meter remotely operated vehicle that we could use to explore the deep reaches of the ocean. 
The Monterey Bay Canyon is the largest canyon on the west coast of North America, and it is just a gorgeous, stunning feature. We think Monterey Bay is the best studied piece of water anywhere in the world. After 16 years of research here, we estimate we've covered 5% of Monterey Bay. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and that's actually part of the exciting thing as well, because almost every time we go down there, we're looking and finding new things. In dramatic contrast to Monterey is Cordell Bank, not a canyon, more like a submerged mountain that peaks at 120 feet below the surface in turbulent and dangerous waters. Though only 20 miles from shore, it was impossible to explore until the 1970s when Bob Schmieder mounted the first research expedition. When you explore something that has not been described before, you are guaranteed to make discoveries. It always happens, and we did. What we found was this incredibly lush community of organisms just bursting with uh, growth, uh, supporting the food chain all the way from the smallest uh, invertebrates to the large mammals that we see on the surface. The deep water vitality Schmieder knows is there will be difficult to reach. The wind, current, and strong swell make Cordell Bank an almost impossible place to dive. And it's critical to set the anchor exactly on the site. The anchor placement seems perfect, but no one's sure if they're on the ridge. Zim will make an exploratory dive before putting the other divers at risk. But the boat pitches, and he hits the rail going in. He gives the OK signal and disappears. But the troubles aren't over, and communications fail. Diver, diver, this is topside, on check. Without knowing what's happening, all the team can do is sit and rock and wait. Press some bubbles off that float. Yeah, he's there. Zim didn't descend the 120 feet to the ridge, but he was able to provide the team with underwater conditions and to confirm their position. Let's say about 20 feet down, that current really drops off. The rest of the team gets ready for their dive. If they're successful, they'll be the first divers to see Cordell Bank in over 10 years. Below the boat lies the promise of discovery that makes the risk worthwhile. Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary represents the phenomenon of a geological feature rising abruptly from the seafloor bathed in a nutrient-rich current, seeding the ocean with abundance. The water that flows over Cordell Bank is relatively clean and it's relatively calm. Then there's this upwelling that occurs because of the California current. There's a lot of food coming up from the deep water. This force feeds the population, and so the population just explodes. lush invertebrate community supports a lot of fish, but the fish then support the marine mammals and as well the birds. Birds such as the albatross fly clear across the Pacific to Cordell Bank for dinner and then fly all the way back. After an incredible dive, the team has to fight their way back against strong current. Once at the surface, it takes 40 minutes to get them back in the boat. Finally on board, the divers can't stop talking about what they've seen. Woo! Competition for space is what Cornell Banks is all about. Sponges on Corinactus, Corinactus on sponges, <laughs> just piling on top of each other. It was just amazing. The growth rate is so high that it creates these, um, these unusual combinations of plants on animals that Fabian was talking about. 
for instance, when you see algae growing on sponges, growing on hydrocoral, growing on something else, you know that it's a very productive environment and it's like, like a soup. So it's as if oh, these things live in soup all the time. Hearing your stories makes me feel a little bit better because it is not an easy place to dive. I give you congratulations for diving on Cordell Bank. Well, thank you yeah. for paving the way. <laughs> Half a world away, the ocean's treasures aren't so deep or so hidden. In the smallest and most distant sanctuary at Fungatelli Bay in American Samoa, people have lived intimately with the ocean, but in isolation. We're all by ourselves here in the midst of a very vast ocean. Everything here is special, the birds, the animals, the plants, uh, even the sea. This is a pristine coral reef, as much as you can find a pristine coral reef in the world today. There's probably no place else in America with a higher concentration of marine life than right here. all the ecosystems on Earth, coral reefs are among the most resilient and the most diverse. The reef is most like a city under the sea, populated with characters intricately linked to the well-beings of the reef. The corals that create this complex system share one of nature's greatest partnerships, Corals are animals, and tiny plants live within their tissues, giving them their green and brown colors, and providing food for the corals in a virtual desert of water. These coralline architects spread outward to attract the most sunshine for their plants, building the largest structures on Earth, as well as creating a metropolis for millions of animals. Evidence of the reef's resilience is everywhere, as new life springs from dead coral, creating underwater monuments. Thousands of years, the coral reef and the Samoan people lived in the Eden of a sustainable, self-sufficient lifestyle. The Samoans believe that this is the only place on earth. This is the world. So we didn't know before the outsiders came in to our shores that there were other people around the world. But outsiders did come to Samoa, and when they did, everything changed. The arrival of Western culture in American Samoa brought new ideas, technology, and economic opportunity. But it also brought new problems. And most seriously, overfishing. It's mainly supposed to be traditional systems only. But it's, you know, modern economic pressures and uh, lack of awareness have caused people to use more destructive methods. And one of the worst things that's happened here is people using bombs, explosives. One of the most recent problems is coral bleaching caused by uh, sea surface temperatures becoming too warm. But in general, the coral reef itself is, is pretty healthy and resilient here. And we, we've seen it recover from a major crown of thorns outbreak in the, in the late 70s. And then the bleaching events, several hurricanes. You know, you go back, you go down, and you go, oh my, what happened here? It's terrible. But then it recovers. It's able to do that, at least for now. The number one priority is resource protection. Mm -hmm. That's paramount. And most of what we do is education. Education at Fungatelli Bay National Marine Sanctuary includes the Sustainable Reefs Program of free teaching materials for educators around the globe. The result of four decades is Jean Michel's effort to protect the world's embattled coral reefs. Over the years, as Jean Michel and I and our team have traveled around the world, we're often asked by local communities what we can leave with them that'll help them better educate the local 
people, particularly kids, about the value of their reefs. What might be the, the function of corals on a reef? What, are, what is a coral good for to the reef ecosystem? It protects the fish, it provides food and shelter for the fish to live in in order for them to grow and reproduce a lot of fishes. Anybody remember what the job of a sponge is? Well, the sponges filters the water. Do people eat sponges? Uh -huh. No. So even things we don't eat still have value. But when you're working with Murphy, questions and answers are only the warm-up. The real class is in the water. Information provided by educators and sanctuary scientists is invaluable. But the Samoan people are sharing the lessons they've learned as well. Our culture is based on respect. Respect for the land, for the sea. That's why we are sometimes very possessive of what we have. I think we can learn from the Samoan culture how to be better stewards of our environment. I, I'd like uh, the younger generations of Samoa to keep their culture. Although we are now in a modern world, grab hold of your culture, keep it near to your heart, because after when everything else fails, we still have our own Samoa. This, nothing can affect our, our, our islands. Far to the north and previously explored by the team lies the most remote island group in the world, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. This remote 1,200 mile archipelago has recently been protected as a national monument, now the largest protected marine area in the world, and will be off limits to all fishing. One quarter of its species are found nowhere else, and it contains some of the most pristine coral reefs on Earth. But people who have never even seen the ocean affect these islands through what they throw away and what is carried by the currents to these remote shores. These islands bear mute testimony to the fact that for better or for worse, everything is connected. It's undeniable that we are linked in complex ways to the sea, and that our actions toward it will determine our future. The underwater treasures found in these national marine sanctuaries are a microcosm of the richness of the world's ocean and represent the stewardship that must be shared around the world. What we do makes a difference, and we can no longer ignore the effects of our own behavior. What we can do is continue to learn and take action. And we can celebrate the adventure of our fortunate existence on this incomparable water planet. Stay tuned for more from Jean-Michel Cousteau Ocean Adventures. But first... 10,000. 15? 15, you think? 20. 21,000? 600. 20. 18, five. 24. It's at least 40. Look, yeah, look at 40, it. 4,500,000. 650. 20. 650. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way. I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Jean-Michel Cousteau, America's Underwater Treasures, is available on video cassette or DVD with additional features. To order, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS.
Play fun games and download gorgeous screensavers. Try our educational activities. Meet other unusual underwater creatures. Go on your own ocean adventure at pbs.org. Production funding for Jean-Michel Cousteau Ocean Adventures is provided by... For each of us, there is a moment of discovery. We understand that all of life is elemental. And as we marvel at element bonding with element, we soon realize that when you add the human element to the equation, everything changes. Suddenly, all of chemistry illuminates humanity. And all of humanity illuminates chemistry. The human element. Nothing is more fundamental, nothing more elemental. With additional funding from the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation, Anne S. Bowers and the Robert Noyce Trust, the William and Gretchen Kimball Fund, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. We are PBS. Cuba. Beyond the culture, the cigars, and the classic cars lies a world often overlooked. Cuba, next time on Nature. Stay tuned. It's CBTV's next. Did you know that compact fluorescent lights use 75% less energy than standard incandescent bulbs and that CFLs are available in styles that fit virtually any fixture? And did you know that a computer monitor can use as much energy as a 100-watt light bulb? By setting your monitor to rest, during periods of inactivity, you can reduce the energy used by the monitor between 60 and 80%. These and other conservation and money-saving tips can be found at wattsnewct.com, an initiative of the State Department of Public Utility Control. The CPTV shows you love are supported by our members and the following. Help yourself get connected and help CPTV. Log on to CPTV.org to find out how your purchase of AT&T Yahoo high-speed internet service or other AT&T products will help CPTV educate, entertain, and inspire all of Connecticut. Educational children's programming, the most trusted news on TV, inspiring documentaries, entertaining dramas, and for a limited time only, your purchase of any AT&T service will help make it all possible. Go to CPTV.org to find out how. For more than 80 years, we've made sure your donations do more. With your help, we lift spirits, provide opportunities, offer hope, spark hidden talents, plant the seeds for growth, and work to build a stronger community. When you give to the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, we help you identify the causes you care about most and make sure your donations do the most good. Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Doing good has never felt better. While we can't control natural disasters, emergencies, or unexpected attacks, we can be aware, be prepared. Before an emergency occurs, know your surroundings, including weather, floodplains, and local evacuation routes. Identify a shelter in case of evacuation. Create an emergency communication plan with your family. Prepare an emergency supply kit with enough food and water for three days. And download your Connecticut Guide to Emergency Preparedness at ct.gov slash DEMHS. Save this Tuesday night for the unpredictable. These are big events. I mean, this is called extinction. And the unexpected. Clearly, we are seeing a Taliban surge. For the extraordinary. Tens of thousands of these objects that we haven't yet discovered. And the extreme. This is a tough opponent. 
Life Save Tuesday night for Nova and Frontline. Enjoy it here. CPTV Tuesday. On Nova Science Now, there's a giant asteroid headed towards Earth. We've been hit before by these things. We're going to get hit again. It would dissipate energy about equal to 100 nuclear bombs. This is called extinction. Watch Nova Science Now. 8 p.m. CPTV Tuesday.